All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Good evening from wherever you are in the world. A very warm welcome in this first uh, webinar of the My Hero and Me webinar series. Um, my name is uh, Yves Riers. I'm currently sharing the Belgian Society for Virus of Microbes, which we have lately founded in, in June. We had our inaugural symposium in September, and there we launched this concept of My Hero and Me. One of the explicit goals of our society is to support uh, the young researchers. We want to, to, to support them, to, to, to give them a platform to share the latest results to the broader community. But with this initiative, we would also like to stimulate and motivate them to get in touch with their scientific heroes. Uh, we think that it's very important for every young, but also older researcher, to be inspired by people that are in your same field, who, uh, whose research you're following, on who you put a citation alert and so on, so that uh, in, in, in the process of, of of maturation as a scientist. And we are very happy that uh, Dimi Bukarts took the opportunity, opportunity and a challenge, and he was brave enough to get in contact with the scientific hero. Welcome, uh, Dr. Simon Rue. Um, he contacted you to give today a back-to-back -back seminar on, on, on the shared research interests, which are phage-host interactions. And in both of you, you give uh, a webinar today about the different flavors of phage host prediction powered by machine learning how and why so i'm very pleased to have you both on board here for this uh, launch of the in initiative and we will switch to you but the last technical note is maybe if people have questions and i hope there are many please use the chat box so we will deal with the questions after both seminars are uh, finished so that's what, uh, what I wanted to say. Then, Dimi, I pass the floor to you. Um, if you unmute your microphone, the share is already screened, then we are yes. all listening to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you, Eve, for the, the introduction. So indeed, I'll, I'll, um, I'll kick off the, the webinar today, the first part of the webinar. And um, I actually want to start off just you know with the big picture broad. Um, so you 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 know you might be aware that artificial intelligence, uh, AI, and particularly machine learning, which is a, a subfield of AI, is uh, increasingly being applied in the fields of biology and, and biotechnology. And this is true for the phage field as well. Um, but before we get into the phage field, let's just briefly define uh, AI and machine learning to to just those who are un unfamiliar. So. AI is this kind of vague term, uh, basically, that, that has several definitions, but one that I particularly like is uh, the effort to automate intellectual tasks normally performed by humans, right? Sounds, sounds vague enough, right? Uh, and so uh, machine learning is this subfield of AI that really flips the paradigm of classical programming on its head. So in, in classical pro programming, you would have uh, some data, and you define uh, the rules the computer should do to get some answers, right? And machine learning really flips this idea on top of its head where you provide the computer with data and answers and let the computer figure out the rules. And so the interesting thing is once you have those rules, you basically have uh, a model that you can learn to, um, to, to sort of make new predictions for new data. Uh, so, for example, in the phage fields, we, um, you know, we still have, like, if, if you look at finding and characterizing phages, um, this is still a, a time and labor intensive uh, challenge. And so for this reason, we can imagine how machine learning uh, could be useful for predicting certain aspects of, of phage host uh, interactions, right? So guess what? That's exactly the topic uh, of today. Um, because indeed, machine learning can be used in, in various ways to predict different aspects of, of phage host specificity. And, and this is exactly what we mean with these different flavors, right? Um, it's something that became very apparent to me during the, the VOM conference this summer. Um, hearing you know, various phage biology talks really highlighted that different researchers are looking at different aspects of, of phage infectivity. 
And, and, uh, and all of those aspects are interesting to study and, and also with mach machine learning. So for example, we, you know, we could be interested in predicting the antigen specificity or elucidating the host uh, genus or species. We could start from a um, binary infection matrix and predict interactions. We could predict at the uh, uh, level of the RBPs and the receptors, or we could you know, predict matching phages against uh, a specific given bacterium. Or maybe we could be interested in you know, which factors determine exactly those uh, certain interactions. And so all of these things can be outputs of uh, predictive machine learning models, starting from genomes or proteomes of phage and, and hosts, right? Um, and so the thing is, the different aspects, aspects can be useful in different applications. And, and this is what Simon and me will, uh, will dive into today. Okay, uh, so there's this interesting paper by Lenemann uh, discussing phage therapy and, and synthetic biology, but they also in the paper give a nice uh, visual overview of some of these inputs and outputs that a machine learning model uh, can have. So for example, starting from this network in, in setting A, this network of, of uh, phages and bacteria, we could use machine learning to um, determine what genetic factors are determining the host range, for example. We could also look at you know, that same network and, and find matching phages given a particular uh, pathogenic bacterium. Or finally, Lenemann also envisions that you could specifically focus on the, the glycan structures uh, that make up the, you know, the bacterial surface receptors and, and from that also predict matching phages. So if we, if we look at um, traditional phage therapy, the thing you want to do is um, predict one or, or, or actually find one or multiple phages against a pathogenic bacterial host, right? Which corresponds with setting B of, uh, of Lenemann's visions. Now, in this setting, in, in, in phage therapy, we're typically dealing with interactions at the subspecies or the strain level. And traditionally, you would, you know, if uh, you would test infectivity, uh, of phages against a specific pathogen experimentally in the lab, right, uh, to form this so-called phagogram. And so in the following slides, uh, I want to propose that we can now um, move towards digital phagograms that are predicted with machine learning. Okay, so let's, let's dive into that uh, in a little bit more detail. Starting from just some, you know, terminology just to get everyone, everybody on the same page. Uh, so traditionally, what is and what is still done today, right, is, is uh, the construction of an antibiogram. So here, you know, if a patient comes in, you isolate the various bacterial pathogens and you test those against the array of antibiotics that you have. Uh, and the goal is to report which of the pathogens are either susceptible or resistant against the, the different uh, antibiotics. And so we can, we can do the same with, with phages, um, where you basically, as I said, constructing a, a phagogram in which we test the different bacteria against the panel of uh, available phages and, and see which ones that lead to a productive infection. So the bottleneck here is, is twofold. Um, so the first thing is if, if you don't find any matching phage, then you're, you know, you're stuck and you need to isolate new phages and then test again. Um, and the second thing is, if you have really large phage libraries, you know, let's say hundreds of, of phage uh, isolates, then it becomes burdensome to test all of those uh, in the lab. So, you know, you could argue that phagograms do not scale. Um, so the idea with digital phagograms is that we can uh, predict infectivity using machine learning models and then select a promising subset, let's say, of phage candidates uh, to test experimentally, which, which then can reduce the labor and, and drive down uh, the costs. So how we are uh, thinking about these digital phagograms is really bottom up from the biology. Um, and of course, you know, that's not the only way to think about it, but the, the basic idea is that phage infectivity is, is a process of multiple stages 
and we can mo we can model those multiple uh, different stages separately with machine learning models. So you know one first stage or layer that you could define is this initial host recognition. You know that that well defined step in which the host is recognized via the bacterial surface receptors, uh, which is something that's typically mediated by the receptor binding proteins. Uh, so that could be one layer. A second layer could be um, the sort of the pan immune system and all of the, the defense and anti defense systems that play a role once the phage genome is, is in the cell. So, you know, restriction modification systems and CRISPR and anti CRISPR proteins, all of these. And then a final layer could be, which is more of a flexible layer, uh, could be the, the hijacking and the conversion of the metabolism of the host by the phage. You know, for, so for example, you could look at um, gene expression of factors involved in the response against that hijacking. But this is something that also could include, let's say, um, super infection exclusion by prophages, for example. Um, so how then would this, you know, work as, as a modeling approach, right? Having defined these layers across the infection process. Um, well, we envision basically this multi-layer uh, approach where a separate model is constructed uh, for each layer, focusing on the relevant inputs of that layer, right? So for example, modeling the first step entails really predicting those interactions between the phage uh, receptor binding proteins and the bacterial host receptors. Um, a second layer, at, at the second layer, uh, the different bacterial systems uh, are you know, more and more open to genomic annotation today with several specialized tools. So we can also envision those um, annotated systems being input to uh, machine learning models, right? And then the third layer, which, you know, is, is probably the most challenging one, uh, could integrate, for example, protein-protein interactions or transcriptomics data, and then try to build like a model uh, off of that. So, then finally, if you have those predictions of each of the layers, we can combine those predictions in a second step to have like a final prediction for phage uh, infectivity, which is something we call like a, a stacked prediction model. And of course, in addition, you could also um, have these separate predictions and explore them separately to really have this and to really get this digital phagogram across the steps of infection uh, and which could also like provide insights to to the specific subparts of an infection process so to summarize we propose this multi-layer approach that you see on on the slides um, that really models um, and and mirrors the the sequential stages of an infection process and and basically divides this complexity of phage host interactions into three separate models and those then can be combined in, uh, in an additional step. Now, of course, these, these um, you, you know, constructing these models and all of this is, is, is not trivial, of, trivial, trivial, of course, and, um, and comes with uh, a number of challenges. And, and I'll, I'll mention three. So the first thing, uh, if we're really looking at the strain level interactions, then you typically see that uh, phages uh, can have really subtle differences. And so in effect, you really need to have a sufficient amount of data to properly learn patterns in, in that data. Uh, and so today we feel like there's still uh, only a limited availability of, of strain level interaction data, although we are observing a, a trend towards more systematic characterization and, and, and sequencing, at least for you know, clinically relevant uh, phage pairs, which is, which is already uh, Quite important. Secondly, uh, also, you know, as a result of this lack of, of data and, and also just looking at the biology, I would argue that at least today it's uh, difficult, it will be difficult to construct models across different species, uh, which means that you would have to construct a model separately for each bacterial species you want to make predictions for, which is a lot of work. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, you know, many phage genes today still still miss a functional annotation, right? So this also could hamper uh, a, a comprehensive implementation 
of these proposed models because the important phage proteins in, in infection uh, can be just missed by it because you don't know that they are there. And I want to just zoom in to uh, data for a little bit because I think you know you could argue that data is the most important bottleneck. Um, and it, it, you know if you talk about data, what we ideally want is of course experimental, you know, lab confirmed interaction data with sequenced phages and sequenced host uh, genomes. Uh, but today we still see host range data spread across tables in manuscripts or even in supplements. Um, although again, there is progress, uh, there are definitely uh, very good approaches like the, the viral host range database that tries to bring all of these data together in, in, a, in a central place. Secondly, also data and collections might be not publicly available at all. So, but again, there are efforts to improve this. And then thirdly, also the representation of host range data can be heterogeneous. So sometimes the outcome can be uh, encoded binary. Sometimes it's a multi-level encoding with you know, maybe information about plague morphology, or sometimes it can be just uh, a continuous value like the efficiency, the efficiency of plating. And so all of these aspects um, pose, uh, the, the specifically for data, pose additional current uh, challenges. But I wanna end with at least uh, an opportunity as well which is uh, another source of data that I think we as a field should you know, look more into a bit. And that's omics data or specifically metagenomics. Um, and and Simon, will, Simon will discuss more of this. But the, the way we see it is that metagenomics really provides this treasure trove of, of data that has not yet been fully explored and is also you know, consistently expanding in, in size, right? And although metagenomics data do not provide direct phage host information, there are several interesting ways we could look into these data. And so I'll give three examples. So the, the first is, is really looking within one sample at the core occurrence of, of phages and hosts, right? That could be very interesting. Or secondly, if we're specifically looking at bacterial genomes, we could like look at the prophages integrated in those uh, bacterial genomes as, as like phage host information. And then thirdly, uh, you know, an example that I always like to highlight as well is, is the work of Fernandez Ruiz uh, and colleagues that looked into uncultured phage genomes and literally found thousands of new endolysins with, with novel architectures. And so you could, you know, you could argue that you could do the same for many other phage uh, proteins, right? Or, or classes of phage proteins. So these are just a few opportunities uh, that I think we should grasp as a field in, in the coming years. And speaking of opportunities, I think the, the metagenomic space is also the perfect opportunity for me to pass it on to my scientific hero, Dr. Simon Rue. So I'll leave, I'll leave it here. Um, thank you very much for your uh, attention. And uh, I'm sure we will have ample time for questions at the end of the talk. But for now, on to Simon's talk. Thank you. I'll end the slideshow. Thank you very much, Timmy. Okay, we yes. can see the slide, Simon. Everything is looking perfect. Thank you, and and thank you, Dimi and Eve, for the invitation. Um, I'm I'm really glad to be here, and I think I really like the format of this kind of two parts webinar. Um, I think yeah, host prediction with machine learning makes a lot of sense in this context, and yeah, let, let's just you know get started with more metagenomes, basically. Mm. Um, for anyone not familiar. I'm uh, Simon Rue. I'm the viral genomics group lead at JGI. And what we do is really not so much phage therapy, but we are more looking at phage in the context of global viral ecology. And that means that basically that's the way I tend to think about phages. This is background picture here. Um, this is a you know drop of seawater concentrated and stained with cyber green, which reveals DNA. Big dots are microbial cells, small dots are viruses or phages. And so the idea is basically there are tons and tons and tons and tons of phages out there constantly infecting bacteria and you know archaea, eukaryotes for lack of viruses. But the bottom line is viruses are everywhere and they have their little fingers into everything. That's at least the way I tend to see it. Um, a few more concrete examples of what viruses do. 
super briefly, but basically from an ecological standpoint, viruses will have strong impact on community dynamics and structure because they will kill specific strains within a, a dynamic microbiome, basically. That's that is top right here. Viruses are also very well known for being uh, agent of lateral gene transfers. Um, you know, there are like all the flavor of transduction plus a bunch of other mechanisms by which they will take genetic material from one cell and offload it into the next cell, which may be a similar uh, strain or something different. <clears throat> In the end, basically helping with uh, horizontal gene transfer. And then at the bottom, uh, kind of the quote unquote revolution, I would say, or at least the, the paradigm shifting uh, discovery from the 2000s, this idea that some viruses carry metabolic genes, which in itself initially is very counterintuitive, but then was very nicely um, explored and characterized to show that in this example, cyanophages carry genes involved in, for instance, photosynthesis and uh, other kind of core metabolic, uh, cellular metabolic processes to help with redirecting or supplementing the host metabolism during infection, all to produce more variants. But then when you combine that with a high level of infection occurring in nature, you can see that this kind of viral redirection or viral reprogramming of the host cell will eventually have big impact on, on the global scale microbiome processes, uh, especially metabolic processes. That's a long way of saying, as I was you know, mentioning earlier, viruses are absolutely everywhere and they tend to infect you know, every microbe out there and, and they will impact pretty much everything that the microbes do. Um, so like, like Dimi said, we know there are more phages in metagenome than we have cultivated, that makes sense. It's also the case for bacteria, of course. Um, how many more basically? Uh, I, I will show this in, in just a minute, just super briefly what we mean by metagenome for anyone not familiar with the technique, but basically the idea is you take a sample, you extract the DNA or the RNA, and then you just do shotgun sequencing. You sequence whatever was in there. And then from this short sequencing, you can reconstruct genomes and these genomes become your uh, snapshot of who was there. Um, and you can do that on the whole community, or if you are really a virus minded person, you will tend to add a few steps before DNA extraction that will try to get rid of the cells and really enrich for virus particles, because that way you try to sequence all the material that was in this virions, and that should be almost all viruses, some caveats here, but you know, no need to go into details here. So this is um, the current landscape of metagenome, assembled genome versus isolate genomes. <clears throat> and a few things to kind of um, orient yourself on this plot. First, this is a log scale here. The blue is really kind of a proxy for how many virus genomes are in NCBI. And, and virus here are every virus. That includes um, you know, human viruses, plant viruses, all the viruses that basically NCBI has. I, I'm not counting um, distinct SARS-CoV-2 or distinct flu. Like these are just like gathered as one virus because otherwise the numbers just you know, doesn't really make sense. And then in yellow is um, all the virus genomes or genome fragments we got from metagenomes. And you can see that until 2016, we had still a lot of more like virus genomes, I would guess, like obtained in a traditional way than for metagenomes. And really, 2017, so between 16 and 18, is when the curve really, really crossed. And, and before that, we had a few hundreds of metagenome assembled genomes. And then at this point, we just jumped a few orders of magnitude, went with like hundreds of thousands, all the way to today, where we are nearing 10 millions. Um, of course, when I just say 10 million genomes, if anyone has done metagenomes before, the first thing you would say is like, yes, you are talking about 10 million sequences, but a lot of them will be short and just like not real genome, just like small bits and pieces, which is fair enough. This is the case in this graph. So here is another graph to convince you that, that metagenome assembled genomes are really the way by which we are exploring uh, phase diversity today. So these are still the same two colors, you know, blue from NCBI, this times only phages and yellow this times only the metagenome assembled genomes that are big enough to represent what we think are complete or near complete genomes. And you know you can see the scale, this times regular scale, not log scale. And, and the same kind of temporal pattern where like 2017 is where the two curves cross. And again, the same pattern where like nowadays you have hundreds of thousands of these really good quality genomes from metagenomes and only a handful, like you know, compared to like the tens of thousands maybe you get from isolation. So, so we are getting to a point where we can get very good quality genomes from metagenomes for phages. If you're interested into this, 
I won't talk about this because this is kind of beyond the scope of like Phaedra's prediction for machine learning, but we just released a new version of our database called IMGVR. Um, this is basically a collection of many, many, many various genomes assembled from metagenomes. And you know, you can see on this kind of snapshot of the homepage, the numbers I was just mentioning for like, you know, this 10 million genomes come from here. So basically these are all the small fragments that we consider as like putative virus. But then this number here, which is uh, roughly 230,000, this is this small number here, like high quality, non-redundant. These are 231,000 distinct near complete genomes from metagenomes. Um, okay. So now to the topic that we are specifically interested in today. This is a picture, like don't like take this number with a grain of salt. These are not like real numbers, but this is basically where we are. We have a lot of genomes, most of them with no information about the host whatsoever. And of course, that's a massive gap in our understanding because all the kind of impact I was mentioning earlier, they are directly linked to which host this phage is infect. And so this, this virus genome, like these phage genomes with no host information are kind of great, but we are somewhat stuck in our analysis. So that's why we are so interested into getting some host information um, for most of these sequences as much as we can. So how do we do that? How can we maximize host prediction for extremely diverse, extremely novel phages that we obtain from metagenomes and for which we only have the genome. So typically, <clears throat> people have been you know, proposing multiple approaches. Briefly, like I tend to categorize them into like four big categories, and I mean, actually four categories and two big categories. Um, the first two types of methods are based on like a comparison from your phage genomes to existing host genomes. And that can be based on BLAST. So for instance, if you find a prophage in a host genome database that is related to your phage genome, you can you know, use that to infer host. All this can be you know, not sequence similarity per se, but more like nucleotide sequence composition, KMR frequency, amino acid composition. So this is more like uh, you know, not direct primary sequence similarity, but more like overall you know, similarities in code and usage or GC, things like this. But in both cases, you have a phage and you mine a host database. An alternative to this is to use existing phage databases. And, and phage databases here are like phages that we know the host for. And so then you can, again, compare either using a camera frequency again or using marker genes. And so your new phage is looking like this phage that I know in fact X, and so you can kind of connect your new phage to a host through this proxy as well. Um, if you want to know more about like the difference, you know, flavor host predictions, there were like a couple of reviews, uh, including one we, we wrote like two years ago or one year ago now. Um, so I don't want to go too much into the detail because that's pretty much what was existing before we started our new project. But you know, the bottom line is like there are multiple individual methods that have been proposed to try to predict the host of a phage just from its genome. <clears throat> so when we started to try to improve this whole, whole prediction thing, uh, what we started with was let's do a benchmark of like what are the strengths and weaknesses of the different um, methods. And the graphs will be a bit complicated, but just like the, you know, the legend should help in terms of the coloring. So everything in green will be on the left side here. So host-based, alignment dependent. Everything in shades of like yellow, red is like still host-based, but alignment free. That's what I call the KMF frequency methods. And then the blue part is uh, everything that is based not on host, but on phage. So, you know, comparison to phage and then proxy to host. Um, and I kind of merge gamer and marker genes because they, they look, you know, they work kind of similarly. And so what we did is we, we took phages in gen being that were not in ref so most often not used for training. And we asked the question, okay, which type of method can get you the correct host for as, you know, for how many phages basically? And there are a few trends, like a few big trends that uh, are important to understand uh, just from these benchmarks. Um, <clears throat> let's ignore the second column for now. The green methods, so the ones that are based on alignment to host genomes, they tend to have only a few predictions, but a lot of them are correct. And I should mention that the colored part of the bar charts are the correct predictions and the incorrect predictions are in gray. So only a few, you know, not prediction, like many phases have no prediction, but you, when you get a prediction, it is a correct one. Exception here is um, when you try to predict the host of a known prophage, then the blast to a host database works wonderfully because you know you find a rated prophage, and that's somewhat of a bias of the database as well. So 
this mostly means that you know if you have the right host, you can find the rated profage usually. Um, but you know the main message here is like green is few predictions, but usually they are correct. Um, the other types of methods tend to be um, you know at least they will give you a prediction for a lot of uh, for phages. Uh, for the host-based alignment free, these predictions tend to be like half correct, and then you can be better with like the blue type of methods, the methods based on like comparison to a phages, especially Rafa here, this column tend to be like maybe two thirds correct. So we do have some promising results here. Now the next question is that's, you know, having half of the predictions being false is not great. Um, but maybe these methods give you a score or like a p-value or something that helps you distinguish between the correct in, in colors and the incorrect. So that's the next thing we uh, tested. And that's, um, I was somewhat hoping that uh, Dimi would show some of this, but um, that's a typical um, precision recall uh, graph. So super, super simply, as you move from left to right, you um, allow for like, worse and worse scores, or actually, I mean, we can do the other way around. If, when, as you walk from right to left, you increase your score cutoff. And so you should see a better, um, you know, better PPV, so a, a higher number of predictions that are correct. So you will see less prediction, but hopefully uh, by increasing your cutoff, you get into this colored part here, you get into your positive and your correct prediction. And that works pretty well for the blue method, especially Rafa here. So Rafa initially has like this 66%, that's kind of, ratio here, but as you increase the score cutoff, you have less prediction, but you get into this realm of having like 95, 98% correct prediction. That's great. Um, the green overall CSM pattern, the red um, and yellow and orange have this issue where they will give you a lot of prediction, but it's very hard to tell which is correct, which from which one is incorrect, just from the, you know, just from the score that they give you. And that's a known issue. <clears throat> so at this point, we're like, okay, we don't have like, some methods don't seem to work very well by themselves, but Rafa, especially like this one at the top, seems to be maybe the solution to all of our problems because you can get to a point where we have a prediction for most phages and you know you are like 95% of your predictions are correct. So that will be great for ecology. Um, there is a catch though, is that you know kind of intuitively for this to work, you need a closely related phage in the database. And I'm just showing this part because you know, in, in the interest of time, because we need to move on. But basically, if you look at only the phages that are um, very loosely connected to references, so they have only less than, they have less than 5% similarity at the amino acid level to any reference. What we need in the benchmark is we put like 20% of these phages in the benchmark data sets and we looked at which prediction we got. So you expect 20% of predictions to these phages, and that's what you get for like the wish because of like this host base alignment free. But you see a strong bias against these phages in the prediction from Rafa. That's a long way of saying if you have a completely new phage that is not connected to anything in your phage database, the, any meta that will rely on this phage database will fail. Just intuitively makes sense. So in the end, we have a situation where, you know, maybe Rafa is not so great. Why am I fixated on this 5% cutoff of like similarity? That's because if you actually look into the metagenome assembled genomes and you look at how closely related they are to known phages, that's what this x-axis is showing you. And then you have the distribution of different like genomes from metagenomes. Um, you can see this red bar here is this 5% cutoff. So said otherwise from marine, freshwater, terrestrial environments, the vast majority of phages we assemble from metagenomes have less than 5% similarity to anything in our database. So they will be in this category that is badly predicted by Rafa or poorly predicted by Rafa. And it's not as bad for like human gut maybe, it's starting to get like to the right side, but like we have a long way to go until, um, you know, phages we get from metagenomes are not like this completely novel, no similarity to anything uh, entities. <clears throat> so at this point, we do have this problem of like Rafa seems very good, but we have like incomplete references. Um, the blast base or like, you know, alignment base to host seems good, but it only works for some phages. And then the camera frequency to host seems to be promising because it seems to be able to handle like very new phages, but it's uh, not so good because we can't tell which is a correct prediction for an incorrect prediction if we don't have the benchmark data. So um, none of these um, methods by itself, by themselves really solves the issue which makes sense then, how do we consider all these methods at once? Maybe this will get us to like 
a very more like a much more solid prediction. So that's where the machine learning part will come into play. Um, taking into consideration multiple methods of prediction and aggregating the results to get a more robust prediction is not a new idea. It has been you know, proposed for a long time. And initially it was done manually like this paper, for instance. <clears throat> what we did was we um, decided based on existing benchmark, what would be the priority order. And then we you know, assigned some manual score based on our experience and like, oh, you know, CRISPR hit is like this much, a blast hit of 10 KB is this much, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's really what Demi was mentioning earlier, this idea of like, this was a manual task and, and we should be better. And actually we should automate this using machine learning to make it more systematic and robust. Um, same approach in VRMatcher, like VRMatcher automated this, but without the machine learning part, it just kind of automated this manual scores and kind of implemented them in a nice um, compact way. Um, but of course, again, when you do something that is so manual and you spend so much time trying to fiddle with the score, that's usually a sign that you need to move on to machine learning, ideally. There are a few tools that have been proposed um, that I need to mention. Um, via host matcher net is one. Uh, it's a complicated diagram here, but just the bottom line here is it constructs a host network based on genome sequence similarity. Um, it also puts all the phage or virus sequences in a virus network uh, also based on sequence similarity. And then it connects individual dots to each other. And this time it's you know both based on uh, sequence similarity like blast and spacer and alignment tree. So more of this gamer thing. And so eventually, because we know like some connections are correct based on uh, existing data, then we try to have a machine learning algorithm learn what does a, a good, a correct connection look like in this network and what does an incorrect connection look like. And so then we ask the question, this new connection, this is virus host pair, does this look like a genuine virus host pair or does this look like it's probably not, uh, this virus is probably not interacting with this host. So that's, that's um, you know, the gist of um, the host match on that. FIS detector is doing a bit of the same thing <clears throat> um, without the whole network structure, but basically it's using again a bunch of tools uh, from CRISPR, alignment base, protein protein interaction. Then it's putting all of this into, um, they, they went with like, an ensemble, like somewhat of an ensemble strategy. It's training a bunch of models and then it's asking for like cases where all of these models or most of these models agree of whether or not this page interact with this host. Okay, and now we come to um, IPOP, the tool that we developed to try to address this. So uh, again, a bit of a complicated um, schematic, but very in summary, we do like the same thing as physics or environments much on that, meaning we have an input uh, phage and we test it against many different hosts. And every time we compute, uh, you know, BLAST, CRISPR, WISH, so KBAR based, similarity based, we also added Rafa to the mix. And we ask the question, okay, given all this information about this phage, is it likely that it infects this host? If not, is it likely that it infects this host? And so on and so forth. And so that means there is like actually two layers of machine learning integration. First, we use an integration um, for individual um, tools to be able to take into account more hits. For instance, <clears throat> one of the big uh, issue I had in the past was, let's say you have a phage and you blast it against a, a bunch of host genomes and you get 55 different hits. Do you consider the 55 together? Do you only take the top hit? Do you take the lowest common ancestors or the top 10, top 15? These all seem very arbitrary. And so there is a way to get around this by using machine learning to have the tool consider all the hits and then automatically design um, custom cutoffs and, and adjust all the threshold so that it only consider for each by phage the ones that are the most relevant for host prediction for this specific phage. So it kind of learn a lot of different conditions and situations and becomes better <coughs> uh, than just arbitrary threshold like I will take the top 10 and I will take the lowest common ancestor, thing like this. So that's the first layer of machine learning integration. And then what we do is uh, from this layer of scores we get, we integrate them all into a single classifier. <clears throat> and that's where we ask the question, okay, considering all these scores between this phage and this host, what do you think? Is this a phage or spare or is it not? And we have a few things, um, same as what Dimi has seen, I think in a lot of cases, random forest seems to be, uh, they are kind of old school machine learning, but they seem to perform very well. Uh, I suspect they are well, um, 
adjusted or, 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 or you know, well suited to this kind of biological data that are very complex and, and needed, like you need to take into account or, or be ready for a lot of different cases, basically. Um, and then we also train um, and we made the, the training data artificially sparse that by that I mean we just retained a bunch of scores or like <clears throat> similarity and we removed hosts from the database just because we want the you know, training data to be more realistic uh, to what you know, we typically see in the metagenome. Okay, final information on like <clears throat> comparing these different methods. Um, that's my uh, slide about like, yeah, IPOP is doing better than anything else, which, you know, there are reasons for this. But the bottom line is we are back to like the same kind of plot I showed in the beginning. So x-axis is number of prediction. And the y-axis is, again, my PPV, which is what percentage of my predictions are correct. And you can see that even with integrating um, different signal, we did have, before IPOP, we did struggle to get to this realm of like most of my predictions are correct. Uh, we were like stuck into this 80%, 85%. And then when we try to get more prediction, we you know, get more and more relaxed in the cutoff and, and this, this uh, PPV kind of dropped. IPOP is able to just retain this, this high PPV for a long time. Um, and it also is uniquely able to maintain this predictive power for like all kinds of phages, meaning you know, the ones that are 60 to 100% similar to a phage in the database or the ones that are 0 to 5% similar to a phage in the database. So we are like specifically, we have trained this tool to be able to better handle completely novel phages. And, and yes, it's still not as efficient as with like known phages, but that makes sense. Again, I'm not um, arguing that, you know, this is because we did something magic. We are just building on what was done before. And I'm sure you will have like a slide like this in a year, two years, three years from now where another tool will be much better than iPod. It's only a step, you know, in this direction. Um, and just to give you like, a final uh, sense for what type of data we get. I took the same genomes I showed you earlier, you know, the, my human guts, terrestrial, aquatic and everything, my genomes from metagenomes and applying IPOP, you know, what, what can we get? How many predictions can we get? Um, and for human gut again, this is a colored part here. Uh, colored part is we, we do get a prediction. The dark green is we get a very good prediction and then less good and then like, eh, maybe it's a hint, but it's not a great prediction in yellow and gray is we don't get anything. Um, I mean, it's, it says human here, of course, it's mostly human guts. You get very, very good prediction for most of your phages, basically. So that's really encouraging because that means when you are in an environment where we have a good host database and phage database, we can more and more get to a point where we get a very good prediction of which host this phage infects. And I should specify this when I say which host, I mean host genus at this point, I'm not going to the strain level. Um, for everything else, you know, it's not as good yet, um, but we do have like, you know, we do reach if we take into account this kind of relaxed prediction, we're almost at, you know, half of the phages have some prediction. That's, that's still encouraging. And I would argue, you know, just with the increase in host database and phage databases, this, this numbers will uh, progressively increase to reach the same um, level as human guts. Basically, there is no reason, there is no technical reason why we couldn't do, we can go there with more data. Um, <clears throat> okay, so yeah, I think we are kind of uh, a bit short on time. So just to wrap things up, um, we do need to be able to predict the host or at least some sort of host taxonomy for this metagenome derived phages because we have millions of them. There are probably a lot of new biology and very interesting um, features in these phages, but if we don't know which host they infect, um, it becomes very difficult to characterize them further. Um, and at this point, we do have many different tools. It, you know, it was hard to know which one to use and how to aggregate them. We are getting to a point where we are using you now, uh, in an efficient way, machine learning to integrate all these different signal and get you for one page, one prediction. So we are getting there basically. These integrated methods are absolutely fundamental. I'm convinced that they will be the core of any host prediction moving forward for metagenomes because single approaches by nature will always be, you know, Either it will be very sensitive, but not accurate. It will be very accurate, but only for some phages. So, so really this integration step, I think we, we need to keep working on that. And machine learning is very well suited for this kind of question where you, know, you, you need to kind of guess, okay, I, I know this, I know that, I know that. What does this tell me overall? 
And you know, wh wh where do we go from there? I already mentioned that IPOP is only one step. I'm convinced that we'll get better and better at, at integrating these different signals and getting host prediction. Um, host and phase databases, no, no question, will we'll grow and improve in quality and diversity, meaning we will cover more ecosystems as we go. So that will definitely help. Um, there is a, a few kind of in vitro protocols, so experimental assays to try to link uncultivated phages to host, things like you know, Epic PCR, High C uh, is, is kind of trendy right now. I think both like, and, and more of these methods will also kind of help because it will help us get a good training data sets, meaning we will get more than the isolated phage. We will need like, we will have like phage host connections that are grounded in experimental assays for uncultivated phages. And then finally, it kind of also wraps things up and, and, and you know, echo back to, to Dimi's presentation. Everything I talk about is very much in the ecological uh, field. So that means I'm personally interested into knowing which type of host my phage infects. So like the genus prediction is already pretty good to me. Um, but of course, like that's not sufficient if you want to do um, more precise characterization or if you want to use a phage for phage therapy, for instance. So definitely another way in which this type of prediction is only one step. And then <clears throat> I could imagine a, a, a scenario where after doing this first prediction and having a sense for like, oh, this phage infects this genus, then you may have other predictor specific to this host genus that will um, get you a much more detailed picture, like what, what Dimi mentioned, like this kind of phagogram and move to strain level prediction. I, I don't think we are there yet, but you know, it's not that science fiction, I hope, I guess. Um, and with all that, you know, just uh, a thanks for like all the people involved in these different projects uh, um, from JGI, from Berkeley Lab and, and elsewhere. Um, and then if you are curious about the tool itself, we have a preprint with this QR code here and we have, you know, the code is available there. Um, and I don't know if we want to keep the slide up or maybe actually I should stop sharing and that will be easier for question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Timmy and Simon, for these very interesting uh, seminars on the same topic. It's very cool to have the both perspectives and, and you also stress the complementarity. So we got uh, a new question in, in, in the chat box from Yellow Matanzas. And uh, it's a question for you, Simon. Uh, you ask, uh, are all the benchmarking data you have shown for the IPOP based on complete or near complete genomes or also partial fake genomes? Yeah, yellow is immediately the complicated question. Uh, no, you guessed it right. It's all complete and near complete. Um, I have not, and we have not done the work of systematically assessing what working from partial genomes will mean. We expect a decrease in performance, of course, how big of the decrease and what it will look like. I'm, from what I've seen, it's mostly false negative, meaning we will be getting less prediction. I have not seen too many false positives so far. Although we are starting, because people are starting to use the tool, we just released it like in September, and I have seen some weird stuff happening where you actually um, submit uh, eukaryotic RNA viruses to the tool and it will predict some bacterial hosts. So, you know, like that's, it's a work in progress on this front. So we have a few things to figure out. Yeah, but yeah at this point, if you really want a confident prediction, you need to restrict yourself to like large contigs, ideally complete on your complete phage genomes. Thank you. Uh, if some other people have questions, just feel free to put them in the chat box. Uh, maybe, Demi, I have also a question for you. Uh, the digital phagogram concept is really fascinating. Yeah. But uh, even today, there was a paper published with 20 new phage defense systems by the Sodic Lab uh, in, in Solhos Microbe. Uh, so uh, what do you think, how feasible is that? When, when do you think the digital phagogram can be finished if you're still today <laughs> finding so many new phage defense systems that also yeah. uh, affect on the on the specificity yeah it's true it's it's um i think one of the that's the that's probably the biggest challenge if if well if you look at the first layer right the and, and that's also like the focus of, of, of my phd that first layer is really um you know you could say it's the most defined in, in some ways i i would say um the, that initial recognition between the phage, uh, you know, the, the, the host receptors and the, the RBPs. So that, you know, it's, it's really a thing, but um, 
if you consider them defense systems and indeed like uh, many, many more are being discovered uh, and have been discovered over the years, right? Then you really get to a complex situation where, um, you know, it, it becomes more and more difficult to, if, if you, you know, want to integrate all these systems in machine learning models. Um, so it's actually a good, um, I think, complementary uh, sort of vision to what, um, let's say, Jean-Paul Binet talks about in his uh, Fitch Therapy in, in 2035 paper, where you just have the genomes as input and, and you, uh, you make predictions for those uh, directly from the genomes. So when will the phage, the digital phagogram be finished? Well, if, if we keep on discovering new defense system, then it will never be finished, I guess. Yeah. Um, I, think the, I think the challenge is if you really, you know, if you look at it from, from this side, right? From the biology side up, then the challenge becomes to, um, to integrate information that you have but still leave room for machine learning models to also discover patterns that you don't, you know, that you might not have information for. And that's the real challenge. If you can do that, then you can, you know, leave, leave room open for systems that are not yet discovered, but, mm. but that's a real challenge. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually had a, had, an, had, a, had a question for Simon, uh, which was a, a question I was thinking about during the talk is, so, so we're seeing a lot of these uncultured phage genes, right? So one question I have then is, how many of those do you think could be cultured if we, you know, if we, let's say we predict the host and say, okay, we find the host, how many of those can we then actually test in the lab for the the host that we predict because that would be an interesting uh that would be an interesting idea i think yeah <clears throat> i guess so high throughput cultivation based on metagenome data has been something that has been floating around for a little while um it's surprisingly at least to me but like i don't know maybe it's not that surprising um something that in my experience funding agencies and funders have not been very excited about uh, or maybe we just pitch it wrong, I don't know. But at least we had a hard time kind of convincing them that this is something that is interesting. They are, you know, excited about like big data, whatever, like machine learning. But then when it's time to say, okay, we need to spend a few years to figure out how we can translate this sequence data and develop an experimental framework so that we can really use them to then get a specific target phage in a test tube, basically, in a ideally pure culture, or at least in an incubation enrichment that is close enough that we can then use it. I don't know, it has never really, you know, caught, I guess, so far. Um, but I think a lot of them could be cultivated in a broad sense. And by that, I mean, um, and that's, you know, work that has been done again way, way, way um, before we did all this sequencing. You know, it's old school phage biology. Um, Plax is only getting you a few phages of all the phages that can infect a specific host. Like you have many, many phages that will never do any plaque in, you know, lab cultivation. Um, they will be like invisible to your naked eye, basically, if you just look for like this big clearing. Um, I think crossphage was a wonderful example of how you can go from sequence to culture. Um, and I think, um, you know, at the Vega conference we just organized a few weeks ago, there was like some really cool results on the actual original crossphage being finally isolated in Stanford. That's really exciting. And, and this is a phage that didn't do any plaques. Like basically, you can you can follow it by qPCR. It it replicates in in the test tube, but it will it won't get you a plaque. So that's one example. But crossphage is also 2014, right? The first publication. So it has been almost 10 years, and that's one phage. So that's where like the technological gap resides, and and I think someone needs to figure this out and get some funding to do so. And so far, uh, you know, I have not seen. If if any team is doing that, great, and and we will be happy to help in any way we can, because that's really exciting. Um, but on our side, we had a you know issue kind of trying to sell this. In the meantime, another question popped up in the chat box uh, for you, Simon. Uh, the question sure. is, how do you deal with two or more phage host genus pairs um, have a good uh, IFOP score? Do you take mm -hmm. into account all pairs or the LCA of the host genera? So yeah, at this point, we are scoring all genera independently from each other. So one phage could give you three different genera with a very high score. And um, 
at this point again, that's kind of it's on you. It's like okay, you you figure this out. Which you know we gave you three scores and that's it. Um, I don't know that we have enough data on host range. Like getting data on like one phage, one host. So you know this is a correct phage host pair. Like this phage can technically infect this host is already kind of difficult, and we already have to kind of play around with this data to get proper training data set that machine learning can use. If we start to look into you know broader host range, I don't know that we have enough systems where one phage has been systematically tested against a broad range of hosts, so we can tell okay this is a positive interaction, this is like a negative interaction thing like this. And so I think this will be very hard to train any model to detect actual, you know, broad host range phage versus, you know, incorrect prediction for two of them and only one of these genera is correct. So that's that's where we are, I feel, for most of these phages. Yeah. Mm. Simon, you have been identified as the scientific hero of Demi. You're the first scientific hero of our society. So how does that feel when you got this email, this invitation from Demi? It was, it was so nice. Yeah, it was very, very kind and very nice. And, and uh, actually, we did exchange a few emails with Demi before because I made a mistake in the review I <laughs> shared earlier. So that, that is weird for like then being a hero, but sure, <laughs> I'm happy to do that. But yeah, no, it was, it was very nice. And yeah, I, I like... I think it's a great, um, like this format is really great to kind of not just get taught from early career people, but like pairing them with, uh, I guess, less early career, let's call it that way, to be nice to everyone, um, is I think a really great way to kind of get more engagement for all the community, basically. So yeah, I think it's a great initiative. We, we'll probably try to replicate it in some way or form here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I see there are a lot of young researchers participating today in the webinar and then i would like to encourage everyone to think who is your science security it's often more than one person or so but uh, as a society we are there to help you to reach out to your scientific hero the chance is very high that that you get a positive res response simon the response was also very quickly there so it's a unique opportunity to get into contact and we have a standard text from our society that you can use to explain the format to your scientific hero and i really encourage you to to try this yourself and uh, just contact us and we will help you and 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 maybe it's you who is giving the next uh, my hero and me seminar um, another reason why we organize this webinar uh, simon is to 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 make clear to to all the young researchers that that the research is not simple a research progress comes with a lot of trial and error failure and you are now identified as a hero but once you were also a young researcher and i am sure you also faced this this trouble that all young researchers have how, how could you deal with that um I guess, yeah, uh, so the story I like to tell about this is actually one of my scientific heroes as well, uh, which is Mart Krupovich. So, you know, when I was a PhD student, uh, near the end of my PhD, I started a new project that was, you know, data mining of all virums we had. At the time, it was like maybe 50 virums. It was kind of, you know, 2010, 12. Um, so the long story short is I spent nine months on this project, uh, you know, and I, you know, through my advisor was able to connect to Patrick Forter and Mark Krupovich and they went on board into projects that I was really excited. These were like two big names that I was so happy to work with. I exchanged a few emails with them, they helped me. Um, except after nine months or so of work, like Mark came back to me one day and was like, you may want to double check this, this is weird in the data. And then when we started to double check this uh, thing that he, he pointed out, we uh, discovered that everything that we were working with was basically too contaminated for us to work with. And so the whole thing was ended like there was no way to do what we wanted to do so nine months of work that we just like had to trash plus the fact that for nine months I had like asked them for feedback and they had spent time on my project which was wasted and I felt awful of course like you know my time wasted was one thing but like wasting time from like this you know senior impressive leaders in the field I was I was feeling so bad so I sent like a long email like oh I'm so sorry etc like you do when you're a PhD student you just feel awful and, and I think Martin like a two word response, which I probably can't tell because it's recorded like expletive happens basically was like, you know, his, his response and super matter of fact, like, yeah, just these things happen. Just, you know, you move on, that's all good. And it made a massive impression on me just saying like, okay, so yeah, it, it's not about like, you know, me being a failure or whatever, like, you know, being me not being able to see it before. It's just like, it's a regular 
way of research. You can you can spend months on a project and it just you know it's doomed from the beginning. You just missed it and and you just figure it out like after nine months or like years even. And and you know if if he can take it, then I decide like okay yeah I can take it too. And that's that's you know again that that's my story about like hero and, and failure. But yeah, it just made such a big impression on me that they could just like pass over this. Thing. Yeah, that's not a big deal. Like you know, we expect a lot of projects to fail basically. So there is where your own scientific heroes who played an important role to to keep you calm and uh, so oh, this may be a very yeah. important message for everyone to close this webinar that even if you face a nine month uh, troublesome period uh, you come over it and you can become the next scientific hero for someone else. So thank you Dimi and Simon uh, to organize this and to have to prepare this back to back seminar and as I said, we are looking forward to other candidates. Uh, just reach out to us and we will help you to set up the next uh, My Hero and Me uh, seminar for you. So I wish you a nice evening, a nice day, Simon, for you. Thank and you. I hope to see you soon again. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.